it's the next level. You'd think loneliness would be impossible all crammed in here. But this train was designed to separate us from our possessions, from our loved ones. Now, every last shred of us is worth something to someone. Everything's rare, so you gotta pay with something personal. And we're all trading up for the most valuable thing there is, access. Access all the way to first, where they hold the table for sport, then trade it right back down. Panelers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this week we are covering Snowpiercer, episode three, season one, Access is Power. Yeah, I had to watch this I had to watch this one three times. Uh the first time I watched it, I think I watched it right after we recorded last week, and I remember going being very confused about the whole thing with that little chip uh, at the very beginning, and then when they pick it up at the end and they explain it. So I, I literally, I had to watch this one three times to to really get all the stuff that is going on because there's so many different intricate kind of plot things that are happening here, but it, it I'm sure they're going to bring at least some of them together by the end of the season. Yeah, definitely. And I love the idea that they're using a chip <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. because it's kind of where everything is leading in this world as it is because... People talked about barcodes and chips and mm -hmm. whatnot, but in this small little universe of a train, apparently they're using this and utilizing it, which is very yeah. interesting because there's a lot of bargaining that's going on, it mm -hmm. seems. Yeah, yeah, and we saw that with the little girl when she took the, the ripped off hand and used it to open the, the door yeah. in, the, in the second episode there. So yeah, so it, it definitely is, uh, access is definitely power on this this train, which is the title of the episode. So yeah, you want to lead us in into the synopsis? Absolutely. So season three, season one, episode three, access is power. Layton descends into Snowpiercer's black market with Till, searching for both the killer and a valuable commodity for his revolution. Melanie stages a prize fight to distract the passengers from mounting class tension. Bum bum bum. Yeah. <laughs> so we should actually get on to our top fives regarding this. Good evening, passengers. Be advised, track conditions will deteriorate over the next 24 hours. And I'll start, and my number five would be the introduction to trade as a way to move up or down based upon your wants and needs, whether for status or for getting what you want. A little society within a train similar to the world and pretty much goes deeper, you know? Yeah, that runs that whole that whole concept runs throughout specifically really this episode because we see we see the flashback of Leighton and Zara when she has apparently agreed to go work in the night the night car yeah and that's going to move her up to I guess third class is where she's at. We discover that Jinju, the the Asian woman that was uh, you know mining the fish, is in second class. And uh, we, we learn a lot about those different classes there that, you know, the pri during the prize fight or before the prize fight, Melanie announces that the winner will upgrade from third class to second class. So it's, it's, we're really getting this idea of there is ways that they have established, whether they, they had established this before the train actually started moving or whether it's something they've realized over the years, hey, we've got to figure out this class struggle and how people can advance because we've got to give people people need something to strive for yeah in the world you know and so i can see that they had to kind of establish this setup of giving people that glimmer of hope like giving the tailies that glimmer of hope that hey you can get picked for an for um 
you know, for an internship and you can or apprenticeship is what they call it. You can be an apprenticeship. You can be an engineer. You can be a lawn. You know, he said one of the kids was working like in the laundry and he's like, he's got his own fork. So we're really seeing this idea of these classes and how they're, they're getting people to be able to move up the train. And the, there's also with that, the possibility that you can be demoted, I would assume. Yeah. You know, that if you lose your status at first class, you can be dropped down somewhere like that. So my number five is, uh, is similar to that, but it's, it's that the way it starts, I loved how it was like kind of flashing back between we see Dr. Klimt and I, I thought it was kind of interesting that Dr. Klimt is both taking care of the sleepers in the drawers. And he's also the one who's cutting, you know, he's cutting Miles's hair and he's preparing him to, you, you would think they would have different doctors who would do that, but uh, you know, they, they cut from uh, him kind of taking care of Nikki's teeth and, and some of the other, and showing what he does to take care of the sleepers and then Miles's hair. And then we see the guy who cutting the implant out of the arm. And it looks like that was one of the arms that was um, that was cut off from the guy who was killed, who they're 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 investigating his murder. Yes, because it was severed there. So I don't know who that guy is. I don't know if we're going to see him again. If, I would hope they wouldn't drop this person in and then not show him again. Or maybe we did see him in the episode and I just didn't notice it. But then, of course, we get that that scene at the end where somehow we see the the little implant moving from person to person, like the one guy loses it at the poker table or the whatever poker table he was at and then we see that the, that it ends up with the janitor and then somehow Leighton trades with the janitor to get it and he gets it to Josie through that kiss of theirs yeah I didn't really see the doctor in the previous episode so yeah, yeah. no it took it, it took until literally it took until the third watch for me to catch the the guy cutting that out of his arm out of the arm and realizing that, okay, that's one of the severed arms of the guy who was the, who was tortured and killed. Like it was the third, literally the third watch before I realized, Oh, so it was, it was like real quick. And if you weren't paying attention at that exact, you know, four or five seconds or three seconds, when it shows him cut that implant out of the arm, then you see it move from person to person. You wouldn't have realized where it came from. Oh, okay. You're talking this episode. I was talking previous episode. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize, you know, the doctor in the previous episode. But I actually caught that with the him take, cutting out right, the implant. Okay. And it's yeah. being used as pretty much money or some sort of... Well, no, that's that's how the... That's, I'm sure that what they do is they program into those chips what door you can open. Oh, definitely. And people are is, bothering is what, in... to get those things. Yeah. Yeah. So there's probably more to it in, in – so, yeah, I think we're going to see this. There's more to this chip, obviously. Oh, definitely. And that will lead me to my number four, which would be like – I like how the investigation goes deeper and it's the, the brakemen that are manipulating the chromal drug to get what they want. You know, they're just as susceptible to mm -hmm. all this greed and want and to get what they want as well. So – they're just as easily manipulated as anybody else that is not just a regular, you know, train car going person, mm -hmm. you know, whether what class they are. Yeah. And it's that it's it's an interesting because he's it's we're really seeing kind of how an investigation like this, the only way it would be able to proceed is you'd have to figure out like Leighton has to ask, well, can I know what he was what he was uh, snitching to you on? And they're like, well, it was the chronol drug and then okay now he knows because now he's got the connection because he's like well you know your brakemen are selling that chronol to the tailies for you know sexual favors and and so suddenly we start to dig into this conspiracy and we realize how deep this is this is going and roche you know gets the idea that not all of his brakemen you know it's it, are, are uh you know squeaky clean yeah they're, they're, not all... they're, they're a bit corrupted <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> So my number four is I loved and I, I didn't catch it until the third the third watch. But Melanie she gets that message from Mister Wolford, the written one yes. that she puts on her clipboard and then she reads it. She gets it from like this pneumatic kind of tube that's on the the wall of the train. And Jinju goes and she gets it and then she brings it to Melanie. And I thought that was that was really an interesting thing because she unrolls the scroll and she says, oh, we have a special message from Mr. Wilford himself. And then she reads it and it's it's another one of those things that I'm, I'm getting a little confused about this Jinju 
<laughs> character. Yeah. Because because when she when Melanie says that it is from Mr. Wilford, it seems like Jinju kind of gives this kind of look like she knows the truth. But then later, you know, when they reveal that she is in a relationship with Bess Till, and Bess Till starts talking about Mr. Wilford, she perpetuates the lie of, well, we just need to to you know, trust Mr. Wilford and, but be careful of Melanie Cable. So it's kind of an interesting that she's almost like, it's like a duality. Say, yeah. It's like a duality. I didn't want to say like an undercover. Cause I don't think she's doing it. Like, I don't think she's doing it by orders. I think she's just, she's just playing her part. Her role is she's not allowed to tell people she needs to keep people having that trust in Mr. Wilford. And you're not allowed to know that Melanie is actually Mr. Wilford or acting so she, as Mr. Wilford. We don't right. know. So she, so she can't tell, she can't tell till about it, but she definitely wants to make sure till knows that Melanie is a little bit more powerful than what don't trust Melanie too much. You know, be careful around her because she's very powerful. Exactly. So. Yeah. Keep her at arm's distance. Uh, it's yeah. that old saying of keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And, mm -hmm. yeah, that's literally what it is. It's like, just be wary of where you're going and what information yeah. you're giving out. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So my number three would be uh, Andre's thinking that Cronal was a version of the suspension drug. Cronal mm -hmm. being made from it and Andre, you know, basically grilling the doctor at that point. But the narrative from the doctor, I think, is very important with what's going on overall. And I think this will probably be unveiled over time. Yeah. He definitely, he knows more than he, he can't be as dumb as he looks and as dumb as he acts. I, I can't believe that he is because it's just, it's too, how would you not know that you're providing your, you know, what they say? You skimmed off some of the actual pure suspension drug and you get, you're giving it to a courier who's then taking it away and you're getting things from the black market that you need for it. You have to know this drug is being used for something. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to take it and do nothing with it. And so for him to suddenly realize like, oh, I didn't realize that what I was giving them was being made into Cronol. No, you, you did. There's no way you wouldn't have known. Like, so because the, the side effects are exactly the same, the side effects of Cronol, you know, abuse are the same as what you're seeing in people who are long term in the drawers. So, so yeah, there's, there's more to Dr. Clint. And I hope I, I couldn't figure out at the end there when the guy is going through and killing, I couldn't figure out if the doctor, if Dr. Clint was one of the people that he killed or not. I, I wouldn't, I would hope not because he's too big of a a pivotal role. I would hope they were just, he killed some guards there getting to Nikki there at the end, but we won't find out until the next episode. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so my number three is uh, just the, the relationship that is kind of growing between Anje and, and Roche. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, first Roche kind of threatens him because they find that slip of cloth that he was trying to pass to the sanitation workers. And he tells Andre, well, I'm going to stick your head out a porthole. If I find out you're trying to communicate with the tailies again. That's kind of vicious and with the porthole. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, man. That, 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 in, in, and then just a few scenes later, they have this kind of respect that kind of builds up between each other to where he says he's going to take the, uh, he's going to take the lead on questioning Osweiler. He says, I'm going to shake this thing up. And then when they go to question Zara, Roche says, well, you talk to my guy, I'm going to talk to your guy. And so there's this kind of, it's, it's kind of a partnership, but it's not really. And, but then, you know, it's, it's great that Sarah tells Andre that it was the janitors that she doesn't really tell Roche, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, and then, and then later they're sharing that meal, uh, you know, he, he cuts some apple off and gives it to him. He's talking about his kids and his wife. Yeah. There's just it, it's a it's a weird kind of relationship and it's it's interesting to see how this develops and uh, moves forward some more. Definitely, there there, this actually opened up this third episode opened up so much more that we did not mm -hmm. see within the first two episodes. So we're yeah. starting to see a lot of more character development, a lot of character uh, interaction with what's going on within the story, and we're learning a little bit more about these characters where their time is present within the actual yeah. train itself and yeah. how that society is actually going, which 
you know, really intrigues me because this is almost like a country unto itself within a train, you know? Oh, it's a world. This is a world. This is not just a country. This is the whole <laughs> world that we have. It's it's kind of like, you know, that there's I don't think there's really anything we could compare it to unless unless we had some you know, some cruise ship that got stuck on the ocean for like an extra 6 months or something. Yeah. And they would have to develop some kind of a of of a of a thing, you know, but yeah, no, it's it's a it's definitely a country. It's definitely a world. Of its of its own, yeah. yeah. So I agree, definitely. And that will lead me to my number two, which would be uh, the separation during the fight night in the car. How all those mm -hmm. that are in third and tail are pretty much on the floor, and all the rest, like the first and second, are on the balcony and you know cheering on their fighter. Yeah, it, it, it's a way to keep them all separated. And I'm not trying to post a, a pun based upon the offspring <laughs> song <laughs> gotta keep them separated but you know but the thing is is that you could see how everybody is separated even the people in the tail and comparison to the people that are on third they're separated by areas even on the floor yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they're they're the different the different workers are in their own area. Like like Bess says, he he tells her those are the janitors over there. I don't know any of those guys. That's not my beat. So she, they're all together. And this was actually number one. So I'll switch mine around. I'll, I'll talk about this whole fight night thing because I I thought it was really really cool that we have. And, and you mentioned the you know the one armed janitor fighting a woman. Which I, I thought was interesting was the the, the gender they didn't care and uh, it looks like from what I could tell the woman won I guess the goal was to knock your opponent off the platform yes. because that's when when she knocks him off and he lands on the floor then she kind of crowd surfs like celebrating and he gets up off the floor and then he starts that whole fight. Mm -hmm down there uh at the at thing. it just so, becomes a whole uh, brawl at that point yeah, yeah yeah um but i thought what was really really cool about that was that was the distraction that andre needed in order to get to talk to the head janitor because remember he says i'm gonna get away from till and we'll figure this out and you know somebody let nikki out of the drawers car because she wanders into that fight and then till takes her away. And then next we have this big fight going on. And I love the conversation that Andre has with the, with the head janitor where he mentions the fact that 70% of the population of the train is second class, third class and tail. That means that the rest of the 30% is that first class section. And when you know when till it, the assumption is that like the brakemen aren't even second class the brakemen are like third class yeah. citizens yeah they are you know and the only people of is like the supervisors of the different workmen that get to kind of be in first class those are the people that she's addressing there when she gets that message that handwritten message from Mr. Wolford, you know, she's addressing the heads of the stewards or something like that. I can't remember what she called them all. But yeah, I thought that was that was really interesting. And yeah, just the fact that this that whole fight scene was was really cool to watch. I really focused in on it the third watch because I really wanted to see like what was going on. And that guy was using his stump like you, you put it. I think you put it in the notes. Yeah, I put it in my notes. Yeah, they uh, that that was part of my notes. It's like you know that his arm was definitely taken off because mm -hmm. like last episode. So right. he, just hitting somebody with their stump, that's just pure like bone straight to face. Yeah. Oh. And you gotta, you, you gotta, there's an awkwardness to it that you had to figure out how to make the muscles work, you know, to, to make that happen. That's not just pivoting your shoulder. You got to put your whole body into that, yeah. Because that's a that's just a limp, you know. That's just a, a limp appendage there. There's nothing. There might be some muscles in it, but they're not going to be able to do much. Yeah. So you got to put your body into that. That's so, full yeah. blunt force from the body right yeah. to the face. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll call that my number two, which will bring us to your number one. Well, my number one would be Andre states that he loves Zara. Mm. I think this will keep Andre going throughout his mm -hmm. investigation 
not just Miles being a reason to keep moving and making sure that he is present on the train as some sort of, you know, importance. He's trying to make waves and try to further himself as a person and to make himself relevant. And I think that's what's going to happen. The Brakeman and Andre's conversation was really good, I thought. Mm -hmm. And then Andre's way of manipulating to get the truth. He knows how to play that game. And yeah. that's that's something that comes from a detective. So yeah. he, I see Andre moving up in a sense where he's going to move up in the realms of where Jennifer Connelly's character, Melody or Melanie? Melanie. Melanie. Yeah. We'll yeah. see him and almost as an equal. And I could see him moving hmm. up in that platform. Uh, yeah, I definitely think, like, I don't think, as he stated in the first couple episodes, he says, I want to go back to the tale. I don't think he's going to actually go back to the tale. Oh, I think neither he's gonna, or do I, yeah. He's, he's, he's going to stay up there because he can do more good for the tale being up there than he than he can being in, in the back. He's just got to work through that guilt that he's going to feel. Yeah about it, but also understanding that he's like an undercover, just like Miles says, you know, when, when he hugs Miles, Miles says, I'm going to keep my eyes open, you know, because Miles said that's the whole reason why he accepted the apprenticeship is because he's like, we need more people up train. And there, and what I think what Andre is saying is he's going to make sure to keep himself and he's going to try to keep Miles from getting indoctrinated into those upper classes to where they're not going to forget about the tailies. They're going to keep working towards. And we get little glimpses of this because we're hearing things that like what uh, what Josie says about, well, our people up train will help us. And this kind of plays into my what is now my number one, which is when they're talking about the trouble with the engine. They're talking about the repairs. And I love how the tailies can open that little porthole. Again, why are there windows back there? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel the same they can way. Open a little, they can open a little, like, I can understand observation windows on those upper class trains, but what's the point of having a, a window back there in the, I don't know. Anyway, but, you know, they open that, that little window up and she looks out and she consults her book and she goes, oh, well, that's such and such mountain. We should have been here yesterday. We're a day behind. And they're like, well, we're, we need to be building up energy and i thought that was interesting because they, they talked this last time that they have to use the engine to build up energy so they can get through the mountains and they talk about the year four slowdown that lasted a month yes and they were like without water they were like without um you know power and heat and so they talk about all the things that they're going to do to make up for what they're going to lose in this power shutdown yeah they were eating people probably at that point <laughs> well yeah back then hopefully that's not happening that's not happening anymore from what we understand but you know but i, I did another thing that occurred to me as i watched the third time today was the compassion that whether it was melanie or whether wilford was still alive or whoever made the decision seven years ago not to uncouple those trains yes definitely it made a, a big sense and you could see the struggle in melanie mm -hmm. of when they wanted to uncouple the last train yeah and and you know it was it was interesting too that every time they said it in the tale they kept saying yet that is constantly a fear of theirs yeah is that they could uncouple us at any time they don't they, they at, at what does the one guy say as soon as our value for as work exceeds uh, or exceeds our usefulness or something like that, mm -hmm. they're they're going to get rid of us. Oh, definitely, so, they're expendable and they're in in the higher ups points. But the thing is, Melanie knows that they're needed, and yeah. the fact that oh, if we're going to need them, we're going to have to move them up, and that's going to start to have like a class clash in that sense. Yeah, and yeah. that's going to be an issue. But they've already seen that with the fight. For, for the fight night itself mm -hmm. and honestly you know it, it's gonna happen yeah sooner or later this we're gonna have this and this rebellion is gonna occur because apparently they have to have one every few years oh definitely so, i don't know if it's gonna be this season or next season but we will see oh yeah uh so we had we had some quotes here yeah you start 
Okay. Um, I'm not going to do my first one because my first one goes with one of yours. But I, I loved <laughs> I loved when they, when she reads that message and the uh, the guy, the commander, Commander Gray says, Winston Churchill, unshaken in spirit and resolve. Mr. Wilford was paraphrasing Winston uh, was paraphrasing Churchill. I looked I tried to look for this specific quote and I couldn't find it, but it definitely fits into speeches that I could that Winston Churchill like there's there was a lot of things he said about you know about enduring about persevering a, a lot of those those kind of things to, to, that he that he would give speeches about so I thought that was really cool that someone uh, a character recognized that reference oh it's definitely very cool in a sense but the fact that he knew more than she did so obviously mm-hmm. she is not well read oh no no I think she knew I think she knew that was Winston Churchill I think she's I think she's writing those speeches and taking that stuff from other other people yeah no i think i mean maybe she didn't but i think she knew and she was just trying to sneak it by kind of play it off (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no i think she knew well mine would be uh the engine will provide and that would be the 10th regarding the boxing match when wolford oh sorry whoops that that would be melanie jennifer Connolly's character asks (laughs) about making it so yeah, that that has become a chant of theirs. The engine will provide the engine eternal. That's a that's kind of a chant they do. So, I loved when Roche was giving him a compliment about his investigative, and he says, "You should see me without the handcuffs." And he holds up. And I I guess I forgot. I didn't realize that he is still doing all these all this investigation that he's doing. He's doing it in handcuffs every time. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> he still has an edge. <laughs> And my next one would be, oh, you're not getting a cut? Authoritarian states usually control their drug trade. And that would be Andre about the the chronal drug that the higher ups just figured out was going on. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a great that was a great little little back and forth there because he says and I've got this in my notes later, but I'll I'll bring it up now. He says that Chronol has been in the tail for two rotations. Yes. And he's like, you guys are just catching up now. But I love Melanie's response after he calls it an authoritarian state. She says, Snowpiercer is an arc, not an authoritarian state. Yep. Uh, and I didn't catch that the first time. It, was, it wasn't until the second time that I realized she calls Snowpiercer an arc, which I thought was really yeah, cool. Yeah, like the uh, Noah's Ark, mm-hmm, as it exactly. were. Yeah. Exactly. My, next, my last one would be uh, survive. Survive, the engine will provide. And that was an interesting statement during the fight night. Yeah, again, that's that chant that they're doing. That they, yeah. It's almost like a religion, yeah. you know, this this Mr. Wilford kind of thing. And I loved when, when Andre was talking to the head janitor, Terrence, and he says, you know what I was in the old time before I became a janitor? A janitor. <laughs> I, just, I thought that was really cool. It reminded me of the TV show community in the later seasons. We find out that like there's this whole network of janitors and sanit- and and like like the the different workers behind the scenes it's this whole network and they have to go and like Nathan Fillion does a yes. guest star <laughs> role yeah. as the as like the head janitor and, and there's this whole network of, of janitors uh I just thought it was that was what that reminded me of when they were talking about the janitors running the black market yeah so. I just watched that episode the other night again oh, and it was nice. funny <laughs> it is it's hilarious <laughs> yeah, listeners if you you don't get into community it's the best thing to watch rewatch again now it's been off the air for a while but you know i've been watching it on netflix too <laughs> it's so hilarious there's so many there's so many there's a there's a running gag in the in the later uh seasons because like in season i can't remember if it was season four or season five uh paget brewster uh plays the it person yes. and then in in the yahoo season she comes back as a different character mm-hmm. and there's an episode where she tries to call it and she's like all i got was this screeching noise on my phone <laughs> like, <laughs> when, like there's this whole world's colliding kind of thing i thought that was really really cool exactly uh, but this isn't a community podcast this is- <laughs> exactly but we're referencing it so yeah if you guys are interested in some sort of comedy to get through everything that's going on now lately go watch community it's pretty funny so I had a, a few notes here, and one I, I've already brought one up. I, I was wondering how long a rotation is. I wonder if they're ever going to tell us because he, you know, like I said, Andre says that the Colonel has been in the in the tail for two rotations, but I wonder how long an actual rotation of the Earth is. 
that they're doing. I wonder if they'll ever, ever tell us. I'm that. curious if it's like six months. If it's six months or if it's a year yeah. or if it's two years, you know, it, it's got to be because obviously it's got to be a standard set amount of time because that's the only way the tailies would know, oh, we're a day behind exactly. in this section of track, you know. Yeah, that's what makes me think it might be six months for the fact yeah. that it gives them enough time to figure out where they are within their travels. Yeah, I mean, six months just seems like a short amount of time to circumnavigate the earth though even frozen well uh, uh, unless they're in a, unless they're only on one country or unless they're you know if they're not going over oceans i six months just seems like a short amount of time plus they don't but, they don't have any view of a sun or anything really to navigate so right. that's what i'm saying is, is it got to have a it's got it's i would think it yeah we'll see we'll see if they tell us yeah true <laughs> Uh, my note would be the, uh, the intro to the blueprints is different than the last one. Uh, I can't make out what it was referring to, but huh. it, it's very different from the first one that we saw last okay. episode. I, I haven't noticed that. I haven't paid enough close attention to the, to the blueprints. We may have to maybe do a YouTube search. I'm sure somebody's got them. Somebody's got to have been like researching this thing mm -hmm. at all. I'm sure. It might have to pertain to the actual episode, but who knows? Yeah. If you if listeners you... are out there and you have an idea and you're really engulfing yourself with this and you love the idea and aspect of that, please send in some feedback regarding that. Um, so I, I, I caught it on the second watch that Klimt says uh, that about he's talking about Nikki when they're talking about that she's still unconscious or she's awake. And he says that everybody comes out of the drawers differently. And so I wonder how many people have they come out of the drawer? Have they brought, you know, has there been like short term sentences? Because so far, all we've seen is life sentences of people being put into the drawers. Yeah. We've not seen a like, you're going to be in the drawer for six months. You're going to be in the drawer for, you know, whatever. So I think that's interesting to see if, if that is the case, if we do have a regular rotation of people coming out of the drawers. I wouldn't think so. That, that doesn't make sense, really, because you'd think if somebody does something bad enough to get put into the drawer, it would be a lifetime. But but he could have just been talking out of his butt. Too, so. <laughs> <laughs> but I do agree with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's it's weird that you brought up the idea of demolition man, and these people yeah. are frozen, and pretty much that's what they are doing within these right. like you know these drawers. Right. Well, and even in demolition man, they said it's it, they they tell you it's like sleep, but then when he comes out, it's not like sleep. And and that's even what Nikki says is that it's not like sleep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, it's like a living hell almost in a mm -hmm. sense because they're stuck in their own mind within that time and they don't know what's going on in the outside world. Yeah, yeah. And that was your last one. My next one would be Andre's reaction to Miles' apprenticeship. He's a you know, you you look and you see Miles and he's excelling. He's a smart mm -hmm. kid. And Andre doesn't want to lose him in some way, shape, or form. He wants to have that connection. It's like, you know, a foster father in some mm -hmm. respects. Because I don't think Andre is Miles' father. I don't I don't think so. That's not the impression I've gotten. I, I, I get the impression that he's an orphan. And that because he's talking about yeah. Josie being his tail mom. And even even um, Andre says that, that, oh, she's his tail mom. So and I had a question about that whole thing. Why do they save Miles' hair? What's what's the point of that? Is it is it just the whole thing of maybe they have to save every resource that they may or may not use? That just seemed like a weird thing. Maybe it's say. DNA and they're trying to clone kids to do something. Who knows? Uh, yeah, it just seemed like a weird to have a bag of his hair. Yeah, that uh, was a right bit there. strange. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've talked about the, the fighter with the one arm. Yeah. Let me just run through. I've got a few here that are just real, real quick. The Folger family, <laughs> they had an interesting uh, way of looking at Andre when they were... All, you know, the daughter kind of gives him that little wave there at the end when Roche is, is uh, you know, taking him out of the train. And they just seem that whole family seems a little bit weird. And I, I guess we I guess the question got answered. This question got answered for us there at the end, because the younger Folger, LJ, when the, the mom says, why is she out of the drawer? She killed somebody. The younger one says, well, she's innocent. And then she looks back at that guy with the short haircut and we see him. You know, there at the very end when he encounters Nikki and he says, you don't remember me, do you? But you remember something. 
you know. Yeah. And uh, so I take it that he's probably our murderer, but I guess we're going to we'll find that out later. In answer to my question from the last episode, I guess Andre and Zara were married because they had wedding rings. Yes. So unless they just had, you know, unless they didn't actually have a ceremony, but they still had the rings. Who knows? I thought it was interesting. I didn't notice it until this, this third watch because someone at work mentioned that I don't, I don't know this for sure. You can correct me if I'm wrong or if you know the truth of this. Is it true that Apple has an agreement with TV shows and movies that bad guys will not use their products? I'm not sure. That'd be I, I interesting. The only person that we could actually ask that is Jason Cabassi on Walking he, Dead cast. He might, yeah, he <laughs> might know. He might know the answer. But I thought was, somebody brought it up at work this week that they were saying they didn't know if it was true or not, and I don't know if it's true or not. But I do. But I thought it was interesting that Melanie was using a Dell. Uh, it's very clearly you can see the little Dell logo on her laptop mm. to make that recording of Wilford's voice so i thought that was that was kind of interesting and then uh, roche mentions that there's a sub train to take people back to the other train but that it's out of order and so they're going to have to walk and i just thought that was interesting the concept of having like a sub train on a train exactly <laughs> that's a, weird a little... <laughs> yeah 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 so we actually got some feedback here do you want to read that first one since i had so many notes sure uh, well the first form of feedback we got was from daphne backman our friend daphne and she says, Hi, Mark and Steve. I'm so glad you're podcasting about Snowpiercer. As a fan of the movie, I wasn't sure what to expect with the show, as most television ad adaptations do not live up to the glamour of the movie version. Three episodes in, and I've been pleasantly surprised as I've already found myself connecting with the characters and trying to figure out who is responsible for the murders as well as learning the connecting threads that tie the much bigger story together. It's fantastic to see Jennifer Connelly leading a series as a complex character who has secrets of her own. Very true. Uh, I think it helps that the series is on a cable channel versus one of the main four as they can take bigger risks, which is actually great. I do agree with you with that, Daphne. Uh, she says, uh, finally, I've seen all five episodes, so I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on episodes three to five. And thank you, Daphne, for doing that. that that's yes. amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and this next one is from, uh, from Alex, from our, our good friend Alex. Guys, he says, first off, with everything that has been going on in the world, I totally forgot this started. The casting could not have been more perfect. David Diggs is just as perfect in this. The way he is trying to balance everything in this is in this is fun to watch. The cold open was was a perfect way to show the underbelly of the train. Who saw that he is the key to the drugs on here? I love how they explain the train through so many eyes. The janitor looks at it like a big building on its side, whereas Melanie looks at it as a rolling ecosystem. It's a harsh world and everyone is trying to get more. The last two scenes gave us more of a clue to what is going on. The security guard kills the killer in the lady scene with the kiss. Can't wait to see and hear more from the train and you guys. Thank you so much, Alex, uh, for that. And we will have a special announcement after we finish up everything about getting caught up towards the end of this episode. Oh, definitely. So what are your thoughts so far about the episode and the show as a whole. You know, I'm still, like I said at the beginning, I'm really digging how it's uh, how it's bringing these different threads together. How we're we're getting so much more of this than what we got in the movie, and I'm sure some of this is explored in the graphic novel since it was like a series of graphic novels. And so it's it's great to see, like you you called it a country. I I say it's more like a world, but yeah. it's it's really to see how all this is is coming together is is really cool and i'm uh i'm i'm just i'm so glad that we know there's going to be a season two at some point because i'm i'm looking forward to see how they wrap up this season and and what they bring us into for next season yeah and my feelings is this got really deeper on the third episode in comparison to the first two episodes. Mm -hmm. There is a lot going on within that train. It, it's like its own, like I stated, country. But in your case, you stated more of a world, which makes a lot more sense. But separated by classes. Uh, yeah. We see how people in the upper class manipulate to get what they want. 
and I'm really intrigued about this because you could actually see Andre is representation of somebody that is in the tail end mm -hmm. of this train and yeah. moving up. And yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but even like what the what the mom Folger says when she says, "Well, I hope that's his undercover outfit." You know, he's not he's not changed out of his tail clothes. Of nope. course, they haven't given him any any clothes either to change into. But I wonder if that's something we'll see towards the end if he's trying to convince them that he's getting indoctrinated into this. If we'll see him change into uh, you know more of a plain clothes like a suit or something. Yeah, I think eventually that's where it's going to lead. And the fact that Andre will still hold on to those thoughts of being a person in the tail end, which will basically stabilize him and he will stand still and be who he is. And I'm hoping the character will improve based upon that. You know, we need somebody who is headstrong and knows what their directive is and what mm -hmm. they're doing, you know? Yeah, for sure. So you had some comic talk notes? Oh, definitely. There's a comic coming out based on Negan from Image. It looks like it will be released in July. And I ordered my copy for my pool list. But Jeffrey D. Morgan himself is interested in it as well. So this takes place apparently after what had happened when he disappeared in the comic. So uh, you comic readers that are Walking Dead readers, go out and get one, you know. Make sure you get and secure your, you know, issue. This will be the first Walking Dead comic since they ended this series last year. Hmm. And uh, I'm looking forward to it because I ended that on my pull list and I actually had a call yesterday <laughs> to right. say, hey, dude, uh, I, I need this. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I saw that that was originally on your pull list. So that's going on. There are rumors of Firestar being in the next Spider-Man movie for Sony Marvel Cinematics Universe, as it's called, or Spunk, as we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. if, if this happens, I will be happy due to the fact that my love of the 1981 Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends cartoon is, it's grown so much over the years. I, I loved it as a kid. I still love it. That's where Firestar was pretty much introduced she was not a comic book character she was brought in into the the cartoon series and then later brought in to the comics but for a short stint so uh, i would love to see that character because there's so much that could do with it and steve and i already spoke about this earlier before we started recording galaxy con is doing their own virtual con on the weekend of the 28th the live feed is free so you could sign up and pay, you know, you don't pay for it, but you just go there and grow ticks and you just basically purchase it, even though it's free, to get there and watch what's going on through Galaxy Con. And, but you will have to pay for a one on one virtual meeting. I plan on talking to Kristen Ritter, aka Jessica Jones. My Coulter is available as well. So you could get them both together individually, what have you. My feeling is I just want to talk to Kristen Ritter because <laughs> she's a pretty lady. And I loved her and Jessica Jones as we covered in previous episodes of our podcast. Mm -hmm. And I loved that series. So check out GalaxyCon's website for that. You know, all you have to do is GalaxyCon.com. And then you could go to there and tickets are through Grotex. Very cool. A uh, couple of podcast recommendations. I want to say congratulations to TV Podcast Industries. They're approaching their 500th episode sometime in July. They're going to be uh, sitting yes. that out over the wave. So congratulations to P TV Podcast Industries. Um, also, House Podcastica is covering Cobra Kai. They're doing two episodes at, at a time. They just released episodes one and two of season one, and uh, they'll be releasing episodes three and four of season one next week and then they're going to go all that through until they get through season two i believe and i i don't know if there's a date for season three yet but i think they're talking about that it, uh, season three of cobra kai is being shopped around to some different studios maybe yeah they're talking about amazon or netflix yeah so we'll see or maybe even hulu so keep your eyes posted on that listeners if you're into that whole cobra kai thing like i am jason is really into it and i love jason's thoughts because he's so passionate about it and you can actually hear steve probably 
I did. I sent him in <laughs> feedback for the Karate Kid movie. I sent him in feedback for episodes one and two and episodes awesome. three and four already, I think. So yeah. my recommendations would be Mike and Ming on the Mike and Ming show on Smodcast, as well as Tell Him Steve Dave on the Smodcast Network. So check those guys out. They are good friends and I just can't recommend anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got some YouTube recommendations though. Oh, definitely, I do. As Steve knows, Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum is a podcast, but they also do have a YouTube for Michael Rosenbaum, so he does video all his podcasts. So if you're into the idea of watching Michael talk to his guests, you should do that. Uh, I suggest that to anybody who's interested in that. And I love the idea of seeing Michael Rosenbaum. I, I think I've watched, like, five interviews over the past few days of you know cons he did in the past and he's so funny to watch <laughs> he just basically takes over a uh, whole panel just like michael rooker would so and then on top of that of course the grim life collective with michael and jessica they have a few new episodes that they did with the collectors of horror memorabilia within the florida area as well as going out and seeing where they filmed day of the dead within florida so they're venturing out in their own state where they've done film locations and i really recommend them they are good friends of ours and finally adam the woo he's been going around florida showing uh florida uh, florida california showing how they have been dealing with the pandemic and visiting a few eateries within the hollywood area he also had sean clark from horrors hallowed grounds and sean is a celebrity manager for those celebrities that attend conventions and is a really nice guy. He actually created a company that allows all those celebrities that you do see at conventions. And he has a team of people that, you know, moderate and help out the celebrities when they're at those convention sites. So I would also check out Sean's YouTube out as well. And it can be found on YouTube. And all you have to do is search Sean Clark and you will see a ton of different things. You could actually look for Horrors Hallowed Grounds as well. And he goes through every different horror movies, kind of, you know, where they filmed in their locations. And I highly recommend it. Uh, he's very entertaining. He's, he's a really nice guy. If you do see him at a con, say hi. Say you follow his show if you do so, because... You know, everybody wants that recognition. I would love that. <laughs> well, uh, to submit your feedback, obviously, uh, the easiest way is to our Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com slash panels to pixels. But you can also email us at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one. The TO is spelled out right there in the middle. The number one at gmail.com. We also have a voicemail line. If you want to call and leave us a voicemail, you can dial 845 350 2095 that's 845 350 2095 we also have a website which is panels to pixels podcast.com that will redirect you to our facebook page where we normally put up an episode thread um when we remember to but um uh, uh we'll have some more announcements that we're also on youtube at panels to pixels so go on to youtube subscribe to us give us a thumbs up and check it out uh we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, or probably whatever podcast player of choice you choose. And if there's a chance that there's a way to give us a rating, we would love to have a rating for someone. Oh, definitely. And where else can listeners listen to us? Well, I'm a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through or Brian Malosh on the Talk Through Media Network. We review The Walking Dead each week. This show, Panels to Pixels, will remain on the Next Level Podcast Network. But there will always be a link for Talk Through Media on our Facebook page for you people to go and listen to as well. Listen to us on TalkThroughMedia.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are currently working on a lot of things, so keep in touch here or go to TalkThroughMedia.com's website. Very cool. And I submit uh, feedback to various other podcasts uh, that are out there. You can hear my voice in, in feedback. But... 
we will be making an announcement. I'll let Mark make the announcement for next week, but I'll just let you listeners know I'm going to take a couple of weeks off. Yes, I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> My family has decided to try to do a road trip. We want to go see some other family members. So we are going to mask up, hand sanitizer up, take uh, lunches with us, and uh, go travel to see some family over the next couple of weeks and over the July 4th weekend. So there will be a different voice in your ears over the next couple of weeks. And as Steve had mentioned, yes, uh, we will have a guest co-host and we're going to be covering episodes four and five. So if you guys want to submit some sort of feedback, I will leave a post on our Facebook page. So that way you could leave a comment or you could go through the same routes as, you know, Steve just projected. So our friend Paik Allen will be on with myself and we'll be talking about episodes four and five. We will be getting information from Steve if possible and then playing an audio or maybe just whatever he wrote for <laughs> the uh, the episodes at hand. I'll see what I can do. Yeah, he's going to see what he can do, which is good. So basically, that's our show for tonight. And I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we will see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.